Good afternoon, if you're in Europe, and otherwise, good morning to you if you're on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, we will be talking about the Bottom Modernization Toolkit today, uh, just short introduction. Uh, the Bottom Modernization Toolkit is an automation support framework for transforming Swing and Vaden 8 applications to modern Vaden flow-based web applications. Actually, Vaden Modernization Toolkit is going to be applicable to uh, you know, any application that is uh, using Java. Uh, so this is a Java-based uh, modernization solution and it's uh, a targeting flow, of course. We'll be looking exclusively at flow framework today, so Vaden's flow framework. Vaden does have a thing called Hilla, but really in almost all situations, flow is going to be the most useful target to consider migrating to if you're coming from another Java framework. So flow has that architectural simplicity, that you start with and you can extend as you need. So it's a very versatile place to start mapping any technology to. But of course, Java is that extra bit more. And the reason, of course, is because Flow is full Java. If your interactive applications today are in Java, then you've got graphical user interfaces defined in an object-oriented, component-based, uh, event-driven syntax, and uh, you're going to have the identical uh, exception handling, you're going to have the same flow control, you're going to have the same Java types and primitives, you're going to have the same floating point arithmetic, you're going to have the same quirky anonymous inner classes in Java that uh, you, you had before. So by choosing flow to modernize a Java application, written for another framework, even if it's a desktop application, you're going to be able to take a lot of lines of code from your application and uh, transfer them to Vaden without changes. I would say it's very likely that over half of your application can be mapped to a Vaden application without any changes. So flow is just generally a great fit. I'm excited to be introducing the modernization toolkit today. If you've seen our modernization presentations in the past, you're probably familiar with the three pillars, what we call the three pillars of tooling that help your modernization project. So these are assess, coexist, and transform. Assess and coexist are really about planning projects and managing risk, whereas uh, the transform pillar is really about uh, velocity. Transform, it's the newest one, so it's the, the one that we've introduced uh, uh, late, latest to this list. And it's also where the modernization toolkit is going to be bringing us the most interesting uh, new things that we can talk about. Very specifically, it's going to be here where we've got fine tuning and feature pack uh, that I'll be discussing in detail. So there's many ways to tackle an application modernization initiative, especially when it comes to getting started. Uh, some companies, you know, they jump right in. Uh, some companies uh, first, uh, they, they do a proof of concept. Uh, some do a pilot project. Uh, and I guess the difference between a proof of concept and a pilot project is that uh, a, a pilot project is typically something that they're going to uh, keep uh, working on even after you know, the, the pilot project is finished. Uh, some companies do an MVP, uh, so they start with a, a reduced version of their existing application based on new technology. And you know, there's, there's really no one way to do this, to go about this, uh, especially when it comes to, to getting started. Some companies, uh, I, I know they've done three proof of concepts before they even get started. There's always uh, something that they learn when doing these proof of concepts and uh, they become smarter and they're able to make better planning. 
uh, but beyond that, you know, even before they get after they get started, you know, there's some companies who are successful with a big bang approach. Uh, many companies are actually successful with a big bang approach, and many companies take a phased approach, and uh, they're successful with that. So we're at Vaden. We're really not saying that there's one best practice for application modernization, but what we are doing are are two things. So, so first of all, we're offering some concrete tools that can help you in your efforts. And secondly, we're recommending at the very least that before you would start, that you would do an assessment of your application. And uh, this would be something that uh, we would certainly recommend. OK, uh, automation fine tuning. Um, we have this process. Um, that uh, we see that many organizations who are successful with their modernizations, they tend to follow uh, a certain process. Uh, now, a lot of these things are optional. Uh, some of these things, um, obviously, you know, be because we're proposing a toolkit here, uh, using the tools is, is uh, kind of core to the whole uh, solution. Uh, so um, we are going to jump into uh, part two of this process. And first, try to understand what are these tools, what is the notion of fine tuning and uh, the feature pack, how does this work? Uh, and we'll understand that before we get to a discussion about the migration assessments, because really the assessments are going to be geared towards uh, what you can accomplish with uh, the conversion uh, using the, the tools. Uh, so uh, let's, let's first introduce the tools and, uh, and then we'll uh, look at the process uh, again. So automation fine tuning here is where we introduce the notion of coverage. So coverage is very important uh, concept when we're doing an automation of a uh, of, of, of an application migration. Uh, and coverage really is referring to references. So we're counting references, not really lines of code, but references in your application code to the libraries that you're migrating away from. So the thinking is the more your application references a library, the more work it's going to be to get rid of the library. So think of it this way. If you have 10 swing buttons in your application and you're trying to move away from swing, you know you have to get rid of all 10 of those buttons before your work is done, before your uh, mi migration is complete. If you've only got rid of nine of the 10 buttons, then you can't say that you've completed your migration away from swing. You really do have to get that number down to zero. So we're talking about references. So what are references? What do we mean by that? So references in a Java application are mostly coming from two sources. It's going to be invocations and it's going to be types. So let's look at uh, invocations first. Invocations are uh, typically method invocations, uh, but they could also be constructor invocations. So in a typical application, 80% of the references are coming from invocations from the application sources to uh, that particular library. So it's invocations of methods or constructors. So the way that you determine that, you can take a method invocation in your application code, you find the class that declares the method, and if the class that declares the method that you're invoking, if it's in the library that you're trying to move away from, then you know you have to take care of that invocation. So that's, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, the second one is types. So the second source of references is going to be types. So your application could be using types that are declared in the libraries that you're moving away from. And there's uh, different ways that uh, that, that can be uh, happening. So your application code, in your application code, you could be subclassing a type that's in your library. You could be implementing an interface 
that's uh, uh, defined in, in the library. You could be casting to a type. You could be using the type as a type argument in a collection or just declaring a local variable in one of your methods that's of that particular type. So any place in the application code where you're referencing a type that's declared in the library that you're moving away from, well, that's another reference that you need to transform. Uh, I've worked with many companies who are preparing their, uh, or, or considering their options for uh, transformation. And I would say that in general, 99% of the work when you're doing one of these uh, migrations is coming from uh, the invocations and the types uh, like we just talked about. There's some other uh, ways in which the application code could be depending on the uh, libraries that isn't related to an invocation or a type, but it's very sporadic and it, it's not something that you find very often. So we're talking about things like uh, your application code might be overriding a method in the library, or it might be accessing a f or mutating a field uh, that's in the library, or it could be using an annotation, for example. Uh, but we really don't see that much uh, of these things. Certainly, it's the invocations uh, that are uh, occurring the most, and then also uh, the types. It's really about invocations, methods, and types. So you can tell, actually, because it's Java, you can tell exactly, it's possible to tell exactly how many of these references that you have in your application if you do a static analysis. So that's the main advantage of Java, statically typed. Java is just very good that way. And a static analysis is something that we do in all of our assessments. So with the kind of automation excuse me, automated application modernization that we're talking about here, which is automated refactoring, we can take a bottom-up approach and work purely on the basis of an understanding of how many references there are in total. And of these, how many are suitable for being automated? And automation is really coming from two sources. We've got automated refactoring of the application sources. And then we have the new thing that we're talking about now, which is feature packs. Let's take the automated refactoring first. And that is done by something we call the Dragonfly Transpiler. So we can talk about automated refactoring without talking about maintainability. When developers hear a word or a term like Dragonfly Transpiler, they can justifiably be very concerned because there's many kinds of transpilers out there. And there's some transpilers out there that are basically compilers. And there's no expectation that humans are going to have to read the generated output from these transpilers. Uh, but there's also transpilers that do have output that humans are expected to read. And that is what we're talking about here. So I see Java developers, uh, you know, I, I see uh, at, at conferences, it seems to be more and more uh, a, a topic that's being presented in, uh, in the Java conferences is how companies are working with things like open rewrite. Uh, so it seems to me that Java developers are becoming more comfortable with automated refactoring because there's more awareness for things like open rewrite and the recipes. So there's a number of upgrade assistants available in, uh, in IDEs uh, that uh, uh, you, you, know, you have upgrade uh, assistants or recipes that Java developers are using that can help them from a variety of things like moving from CDI to Spring or migrating from Spring 2 to Spring 3 or migrating to Lombok, or then migrating away from Lombok again. Uh, there's just many Java refactoring tools out there that produce output that developers want to maintain. And this is what we're aiming at with uh, the Dragonfly Transpiler. So let's take a look at some samples and see what uh, does code look like uh, before and after. Uh, so here's a sample, Vaden 8 to Vaden 24 trans. Uh, 
transformation that was automated by Dragonfly, you can see a very clear visual similarity between the Vaden 8 source on the left and how it was transformed almost line by line to Vaden 24 uh, on the right using uh, nothing um, but Dragonfly. So the indentation is exactly the same. The white space hasn't changed. The comments are retained exactly as is. Um, it looks like in this example, there aren't any comments, but okay. Um, but it's, it's obvious things, but also things like identifiers, they stay the same. Each method exists. Uh, so all the variable names are the same, the same number of classes. It is really a transformation uh, uh, that is happening. It is a, an automated um, uh, transformation, an automated refactoring. We also have a proof of concept uh, where we've done something similar for Swing, uh, and you really see the same setup. You see, well, here we do have some comments, but you see how the comments have been retained. Comments are still there, uh, but we also have some more complex constructs like nested classes over here that are being uh, converted uh, and uh, anonymous uh, classes. They're all supported. So even with something more complex like Swing to Vaden, you can still see Dragonfly is giving us almost this line by line correspondence between the input and output. And this really is a design consideration for Dragonfly that we've deliberately been uh, looking for here at Vaden and that we're sticking to. Uh, we try to limit the extent of any transformation to the expression in which it appears. So let's take an example here. Let's look at line number 46. Uh, we see here, uh, this is an assignment expression statement. And the left-hand side, uh, this is a local variable declaration string. So in swing, uh, a, string, a string variable declaration is exactly the same as in Baden, a, a string variable declaration. Uh, but on the right-hand side, we see we do have a reference to uh, swing here. So we see that this is a method invocation, and uh, the method invocation is get text. And if we resolve this method, we'll find that it's been declared in uh, the class text field, uh, which is the type of this uh, local variable uh, expression here. So um, that is uh, uh, like that. If we take something that's a bit more complicated, then that's in the line below. I mean, if, if we're looking at line 46, I mean, text field is a, a, a Vaden text field. It's just a text field is a text field. That's an obvious uh, equivalent there. Uh, but if we take a look at something that's a bit more complicated, like the J option pane, where we're showing a message dialog, <clears throat> uh, then uh, we, we see that there's uh, something different ha uh, happening here. We have this notification utils dot show information method. Uh, and this has been transformed in, in, in this way. Now, what's happening here is really the fact that <clears throat> what's related to the fact that in Swing, you had this thing of, a, uh, of an option pane. This was a pop-up dialog. Uh, that showed a piece of text, and if the user wanted to get rid of that uh, dialogue or acknowledge uh, that they had uh, read the dialogue, <clears throat> they would click on the OK button and make it go away. Now, in modern, uh, you know, uh, web-first uh, development concepts of modern tools like Vaadin, uh, you're not going to see the same kind of uh, construct actually being used. Uh, it's uh, typically shown as a notification. Uh, it's not shown as a pop-up that might be modal and that might be uh, freezing the rest of your uh, uh, of your interface. But you know, yeah, the developers, the users might be used to this. So what we've done is we've identified this as a feature. So this is a feature uh, that uh, this is an example of a feature that. Vaden has made available for Vaden Flow that provides this pop-up dialog with an OK button. And this would be the default transformation for 
something like J option pane dot show message dialog. So you noticed I said the word feature a number of times, and I, I emphasize it there. Uh, so this is uh, an example of something that we would include in the feature pack. Going back to our slides then, so the feature pack is a different way of looking at semantic unions. And instead of just emulating uh, a swing API or emulating the bottom eight a API, um, what we're doing is we're trying to identify and isolate specific behavior that doesn't exist in a Vaadin and uh, isn't really in line with, let's say, the, mo the, the most modern uh, approaches to, uh, let's say, mobile-first uh, development practices and uh, adds this, this feature. It, it adds the, the feature in uh, this, this bundle that we then call uh, the feature pack. So what do you find in the feature pack? Well, these would be things that you typically uh, wouldn't find if you were writing a brand new app or brand new mobile app today. Uh, but developers or and users, they found this uh, useful in situations like <clears throat> business applications that are only being used on a, on the desktop. So one example of this would be uh, something like grid layout. So uh, many developers were very productive uh, making views using grid layout. But of course, the thinking with grid layout uh, is that uh, you're making certain assumptions about the aspect ratio of your screen and uh, the platforms that it's running on. And you're, you're assuming that this won't uh, look good on a mobile phone or it won't even work on a mobile phone. And uh, that's uh, considered OK. So bringing us back to the automation part of the modernization toolkit, we've got Dragonfly Transpiler as the default go-to tool for automation. And it's going to be for the sake of maintainability of the application code that we would limit changes that Dragonfly is making to the expression in which the reference appears. And if we can't solve the transformation inside the expression, we're going to identify and isolate the feature. And the coverage solution would be in the form of a feature pack. So take a random swing application in, uh, let's say, a, 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 a government um, uh, a bureau. And you might find that 75% of the references could be handled by Dragonfly, and maybe 30% of the references uh, would rely on Dragonfly and the feature pack as well. That would give us a coverage of 75% with the remaining 25% uh, not being covered. So how would you deal with this 25%? Well, this is where fine tuning uh, comes into play. Fine tuning and the assessment come into play. We would need to check for each reference how difficult it would be in order to implement uh, in, in Dragonfly and if the feature pack would be required or wouldn't. And then we would make a number of recommendations on uh, effort and, and how what, what this would cost. So you know, going from 75% to 80% uh, might take us 10 days. Uh, but going from 80% to 85%, this might take us 50 days. Uh, so at that point, you're really making a cost-benefit analysis uh, to see uh, for a specific application uh, what would be needed in, uh, to fine-tune the process in order to add uh, the additional uh, logic in the tooling in order to improve uh, the coverage. What's key to fine tuning and it's also something very different from what Vaden has uh, done so far in the past is that we're going to give a fixed price for the fine tuning and we're going to provide a money back guarantee so we know and you know upfront exactly which invocations which types 
uh, we would be building into the modernization toolkit and exactly what that would cost and exactly what percentage automation you can expect from that in your application. So these are the three core components of the modernization toolkit. It's the Dragonfly transpiler, it's the feature packs, and it's the fine tuning, uh, the fixed price fine tuning service. These are the three components that you would expect in uh, most or uh, Avada modernizations from now on. Now we uh, spoke about uh, point two here. Uh, so we, we kind of jumped the gun. We, we skipped ahead a bit. We, we skipped the migration assessment, but now we know what uh, Dragonfly feature packs and fine tuning is all about. Uh, we can go back to a step that we do recommend, which is to do a migration assessment. Um, we've been having migration assessments for quite some time now, uh, but now that we have this uh, added sophistication with our tooling our, and the offering around the modernization toolkit, uh, we have increased the type of assessments or we've increased the number of types of assessments that uh, we're offering. So the full migration assessment that we've always done uh, which has been uh, until now, which is uh, typically takes uh, two to three weeks. Uh, this is something that, that still exists and is still available, but we've added two different kinds of assessments that are more lightweight and more easy to uh, execute. Uh, we'll start with the one all the way on the right. That's called the Mini Finder Ballpark. And uh, with this, what uh, we would do is that that we would make a tool available uh, for a, a, a customer or an organization that has an application and they're considering a modernization to Vaadin, they would get a tool from Vaadin that they could install and then run inside their IDE or run as part of their Maven build. And this would give information that, uh, you know, it, it would provide, no, excuse me, it would perform the static analysis and it would give us information about all the different references and uh, we would understand what are the invocations of methods of constructors and of types, uh, where, where are they are being used. And then once we get that, then we would be able to provide uh, information about what the, uh, the coverage is. And we could also give some indication of what it would cost in order to increase this coverage uh, to some uh, levels that uh, we would recommend. And uh, this is just a, a ballpark estimate, of course. Uh, but we uh, can go further than that. Um, and that is where we provide this, uh, this medium uh, assessment uh, in between, which is the modernization toolkit assessment, where uh, we would actually give a fixed price offer uh, for improving the coverage to uh, uh, levels that uh, we could re recommend to you. And uh, this is something that we can offer, but it would mean that um, Vaadin would need to get the, the source code. So our Vaadin experts would have to have uh, their eyes in your source code, uh, understanding how uh, you know, different uh, things are structured in, inside your sources, uh, perhaps also understand things like what uh, custom components you've created yourselves, how you have um, uh, you know, uh, extended uh, the libraries that you're uh, moving away from in your own custom code, in your own application code, and uh, understanding also better what sort of other uh, libraries you might be using that would be affected by uh, the migration and uh, identify opportunities for uh, migrating that as well, uh, automating that as well. And then, of course, the, the full migration assessment, this is something that is, is still there. Uh, you would use this if you were, um, especially if you were considering to be involved yourselves in the migration. Uh, if your own developers, you wanted to get your own developers involved in that, uh, then the full migration assessment is producing much more data. It's a, a huge amount of information is uh, produced as part of this and uh, it's uh, shared with, with your developers, so uh, they would be uh, more uh, enabled uh, to, uh, to do this themselves. 
okay. All right. Um, this is really what's, uh, I'd say, the, the core concepts of the modernization toolkit. There are some extra uh, uh, things that are also there. We have a legacy runtime. So runtimes that allow us to do um, a phased migration. So depending on where you're coming from, uh, there's different options available. Uh, if you're coming from uh, Vaadin, so from an older version of Vaadin, uh, you know, the MTR is still something that is supported. It's still something that's available and you can use this uh, to help you do a phased migration from Vaadin 7 or Vaadin 8 to the latest uh, flow platforms that would be Vaadin uh, 23 or 24. And uh, the, the way that this works is basically you create a new application in uh, the latest version of Flow. And then inside this latest, this, this new application that you've created in, in Flow, you would be able to have a legacy container. And inside this container, you could then drop views from your old application in Vata 7 or Vata 8. Uh, so these could be complex compositions or they could be simple views. Uh, it's uh, really doesn't matter. Um, the technology is just, uh, 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 it, it works that way. And there, there's many customers are using this uh, and are, are still uh, using this today. And uh, they, they seem to be very successful with it. Uh, so, so this is uh, an option that's available. Next, if you're coming from Swing, um, there's uh, a number of options that are available to you now. We've got uh, the Vaadin tool called Swing Kit. Uh, that is something that we introduced about two years ago. Um, but the newest thing uh, I, I think, and, and it's exciting, is that uh, Web Swing now has uh, made an integration with Vaadin possible inside their migration option. And they've uh, actually uploaded plugin or an, excuse me they've uploaded an add-on in the Vaadin directory that you can download uh, and activate that uh, inside your web swing that would allow you to uh, do a modernization of your swing application with Vaadin and uh, web swing working together so that's uh, something you can uh, take a look at so really yes so there, there are two options for swing if you're coming from Swing, um, so that means that there's there's more flexibility for you to choose uh, a, a tool that's uh, most uh, suitable for your purposes. How would you make uh, the choice? Well, I I think really the strength of Web Swing is uh, in that it uh, certainly minimizes the duration to get from the desktop to web. Uh, so if you're looking for a no fuss way of taking a Swing application and putting that in the web, then uh, web swing is probably uh, the fastest way to uh, make, make that possible. And if you would be using this method in order to um, uh, migrate and, and further modernize with Vaadin, then you would be doing old in new coexistence. So it would be a new Vaadin application that you would create. And then inside this uh, Vaadin application, you would then have a window uh, to the legacy uh, that would be enabled uh, by Web Swing. Swing Kit is something that's actually very different, and they're not. It's not really a competitor to Swing, uh, but it does solve a different uh, problem, which is uh, organizations that are trying to either uh, dabble with uh, web technology on uh, for the for the Swing clients, uh, while min well, while they they're not really sure if they are going to be able to get users on board uh, for uh, going with a full project. So that's one way of minimizing the uh, impact on IT and uh, your, your ops and your users while you gradually introduce web tech uh, into your, uh, your, your customers. And the way that this works is a new and old coexistence. So this is really the opposite of uh, web swing. So you can uh, actually uh, continue to have a footprint on the uh, on, on on the desktop, 
and you can keep the footprint on the desktop active as long as this is necessary. Uh, this is especially going to be useful if you have uh, users or customers that have very specific hardware uh, that the Swing application is integrating with, or if there's other desktop uh, integration that is needed, uh, then the Swing kit would be something that stays on the desktop and would continue to provide this integration, while in the meantime, you're creating uh, a new application uh, that's web-enabled uh, that could be served uh, to either the uh, legacy users uh, that still have the legacy uh, desktop integration requirements, and also at the same time with the exact same application serve the needs of uh, newer users who are doing things in a more browser uh, approach. Uh, it goes beyond. So yeah, here's Aristotle. He's back from the year 360 BC to remind us that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So uh, programmatic integration is something that you're always going to be interested in. And this is something that's uh, enabled by SwingKit. Um, with uh, SwingKit, you've got uh, full bi-directional programmatic integrations that you can call methods uh, in Vaadin. You can call them from Swing and also the other way around. Um, I, I believe WebSwing does something similar. Uh, and SwingKit does um, goes a bit further then in allowing you to react to Vaadin events in Swing and also handle Vaadin exceptions. Uh, so uh, this extra layer of programmatic integration is uh, something that helps make uh, the integration uh, smooth. Okay, and that was what I wanted to say about <clears throat> about uh, the technologies that enable a phased uh, transformation and a phased rollout of your modernization. So these are available, but of course it's optional. Then we come to point number four, which is the manual migration. So of course, if we have fine tuned the conversion model to cover Y percent of uh, the lines of code or Y percent of the references, then whatever is left over is something that needs to be done uh, manually. And of course, the higher you can get that Y percent, uh, the less work uh, needs to be done by hand. And of course, that's that's always interesting because, uh, you know, doing something by a tool uh, is gives you that guarantee of consistency that doing things by hand really doesn't, especially if you have a large team. Uh, you know, a, a tool is able to uh, convert many hundreds of thousands of lines of code in uh, a, a few minutes. Uh, they're, they're very, very fast, uh, these tools and the way that they work. Uh, so it's really no trouble to tune or adjust the way that the transformation is happening and to run uh, and, and to make new runs and uh, Im improve the application in that way. And yes, you know, um, take the right tool for the right job. Uh, obviously, if you have a, a big pile of rocks and you need to move them, then you know having a tool to move the big pile of rocks makes a lot of sense. So that's why we have bulldozers. That's fantastic. Uh, but you know if there's a tiny pebble, uh, you know you can use a bulldozer to move a tiny pebble. There's nothing wrong with that. So it's uh, it's valid. It's technically valid, um, but it's probably just more efficient if you just reach over and pick up the, the tiny uh, rock instead of trying to use a bulldozer to do that. Uh, so certainly, um, if you are doing a, a, a modernization and there's a certain amount that can be automated, uh, it uh, ma makes sense to have the right balance between what you're doing by hand and what you're automating. There we go. And then uh, finally, there is you know the option, uh, certainly it's an option to redesign certain views so you know that uh, you might have a, you know, a business case for aggressively modernizing or even redesigning certain parts of your application. Uh, as we say here in, in the title, redesign the most important parts of the application. Um, but you're not necessarily going to have a business case for redesigning every single uh, view in your application. It just uh, it isn't going to make sense. Now, there is a whole lot of benefits that you can get 
from, uh, excuse me, moving from uh, wherever you are at the moment to the latest Vodden platforms. We've been investing a whole lot uh, in R&D in order to make it very easy and intuitive to make the user interfaces accessible and working well in all devices and all browsers. Uh, and uh, of course, you've got you know the, the the possibility to run things in the cloud as well. Uh, so um, there's there's a lot that you can get. There's a lot that you can improve simply by moving from where you are today to uh, the latest Vaden. And uh, some simplistic approaches to transforming, um, say these these interactive. Uh, gra graphical in applications. Uh, there's a lot that you can achieve simply by doing theming. So what I'm showing here is a before and after, and this isn't a redesign. Uh, this can be accomplished really with theming. There's a whole lot that you can do simply with theming. It doesn't mean that you need to rewrite all of that code that you've already written. Uh, a simple retheming uh, can, can get you very far. But of course, if you want to go further, then that's possible, and the sky is the limit. Uh, but of course, you you are going to be considering very carefully where you're going to be uh, using that effort uh, and and how much you're you're going to be using in order to redesign certain uh, user interfaces. All right, so that is what I wanted to share with you. That was point five. So once again, um, these every Application modernization is is pretty unique. So uh, this five step plan it, it really isn't a uh, you know a prescription or a best practice or something like that. There's a lot of optional things here that might be good for you uh, and and might be uh, completely superfluous. These are all things that you can discover uh, together with us in a migration assessment, and we can do our best to advise you on the most efficient way of. Uh, achieving their goals. So that is it for the presentation. Uh, I'd say thank you. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Okay, thank you, Ben. That was all very insightful. Um, we do have a number of questions, so I will hop right in. The first one is, is there any plan for modernization Vaden portlets for LifeRay? Oh, uh, I am uh, not sure of that. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm the wrong person for answering that question. I, right. Yeah. Yeah. If you me. feel free, any question like that, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we do have the new Vaden forum. Um, you can kind of ask questions too, but you can also anytime you can contact us from the website. Any kind of questions like that. All right. Next one. How does the converted main method work, and will this start the spring container? Uh. Definitely. So, I mean, the the converted main method. I'm I'm guessing you're you're talking about a desktop application, uh, but but certainly any main method in a desktop application. This is going to be uh, a, a a point where you can uh, start the application, and it would be a candidate for uh, making a route uh, so that there would be a URL. So instead of you know typing on the command prompt, uh, you know Java uh, start my program, uh, you would type into the URL of your browser uh, start my program, and um, you you would be able to access your your application that way. Uh, but uh, typically that would be, happen with a combination of um, uh, mains and uh, routes. All right. Uh, how can I connect PostgreSQL to Vaden? Um, we didn't bring the Postgres <laughs> expert. Sorry. Yep. All right. Um, is there a tool for conversion from Vaden seven to Vaden twenty four? Ah, okay. Uh, that's that's an interesting thing. We have actually had a number of conversations with um, a number of companies. And uh, there's actually a number of companies that have expressed interest in that. Uh, for the moment, uh, all of our automation work has been focused on Vaden 8 and also a bit on Swing. And uh, we're, we've been working with companies uh, on, 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 on these two fronts. Uh, but we have found 
uh, actually maybe a bit to our surprise that there are actually still many companies out there with Vaadin 7 and we are looking at that question actually right now. We are uh, looking at a number of applications and seeing how uh, we could extend the Vaadin 8 upgrade automation that we had previously to something that's now part of the modernization toolkit that would also support Vaadin uh, 7. Uh, so if you have a Vaadin 7 application and uh, you're looking for help on um, maybe automating that so that it's easier to, to get off of Vaadin 7, I would say certainly uh, have, a, have a chat with us and we can see what we can do. Okay, actually the next question, it started off as the same question, but then um, also is the mini finder just analyzing Vaadin 8 or Vaadin 7? Uh, MiniFinder analyzes Java, and it will look for. And MiniFinder can be configured to look for for any. It maybe it's a secret, but okay. MiniFinder can be configured to look at uh, for anything. So you know, maybe if you have um, Vaadin eight, uh, and you want to know also uh, if uh, there are. Uh, let's say spreadsheet or test bench or uh, charts or some other, uh, let's say add-ons that are specific to VOD and, and maybe part of your application. If you want to uh, have these analyzed as well, then it really is just a matter of changing the uh, package uh, filter uh, that is in the interface when you uh, go in and select that. So uh, we can, uh, if, if it's not supported in the version of MiniFinder that you have, uh, we can tweak that for you uh, with no problems. Great. All right. How does Modernization Toolkit deal with edge devices? And there's some examples, fingerprint readers, document scanner, and signature pads. And then the comments and additional comments says a lot of swing applications are attached to external devices. Uh, yeah. Um, so the, the, this is, well, one, one of the big reasons why uh, Swing is very useful is because you can connect it to the desktop completely and you have access to all sorts of things. You can uh, start fiddling in the Windows registry, you can start talking to ports, um, but uh, you know the, the things that you were just talking about, like card readers and stuff, uh, at the moment, this is, well, at, at the moment, your Swing application is talking to these devices directly and uh, the browser, uh, you know, if you move to the web, then uh, the users are going to be using a browser instead. <clears throat> and the browser won't communicate with the uh, devices in the same way. Uh, so the way that we would be handling this would be, first of all, we would be looking for uh, at the devices individually to see, does the device support a web uh, API so that we could uh, just start using the exact same device. And if that's not possible, then we would be looking for other ways of uh, making sure that you can make the transition from Swing to web uh, while having some sort of a layer uh, agent or perhaps uh, the Swing kit uh, that could be on the desktop that would then uh, still give you that communication with the device. At a certain point, you're probably going to move to a web-enabled device. And uh, in, in that case, you would simply use that integration method. And otherwise, uh, yeah, as long as you're stuck to a, to a device that doesn't speak web, uh, you're going to have to have some something on the desktop that would enable that communication. All right. How will the theming affect Spring React modernization for a full migration? Wow, okay, uh, React. Okay, so um, in the beginning of my presentation, I believe I did say that I was just going to talk about Flow. Um, so this question about React, I think it's going into the Hilla direction. I uh, don't have information about that. So this is really just a, a Flow only thing at the moment that uh, is uh, the modernization toolkit. Okay. I hope I've understood your question correctly. 
<laughs> so we have gotten a couple questions about pricing. Um, that is going to depend not necessarily on the size of project, but number of dependencies and a number of other factors. So um, if you do have any specific questions about pricing, you can always reach out to us and uh, book a, a discussion with sales and then can kind of talk through your project. Um, and we did have a question. Do you have any tools for migrating unit tests? Um, tools are available. They're not necessarily Vaden's tools, though. So um, there are, I mean, it, 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 it depends, right? So uh, it, it, it depends on the kind of test. So if this is a test, um, well, I mean, it, it really, really, really depends. Okay, so if you're coming from Vaden or if you're coming from Swing, uh, this is a, a different kettle of fish. And if your unit tests are, uh, you know, graphical or if they're just, um you know uh code uh that's that's also a different kettle of fish um but i mean unit tests should be migrated just like regular code um they i i i would assume that unit tests would be migrated like like regular code uh if there's testing that's involving the user interface and you're actually testing uh the screen to see if the pixels are still the same uh, then you're looking at a certain kind of specialized uh, uh, tooling that, um, to my knowledge, that we, we don't have in Vaadin, uh, but there's other companies that uh, do provide that. Um, and they've made quite some interesting uh, progress in uh, being able to demo uh, the uh, equivalence of a, um, a, a test that they've done in Swing and recorded that test and then uh, replayed that in bottom. But yeah, th this is something if you're interested in exploring more, we should probably have a, a talk uh, separately where we can go into that in more detail. But there's there's definitely uh, possibilities in, in all directions. All right, what impact will the migration have on the performance of the application? Are there ways to optimize the application in the course of the migration? Oh, absolutely. So, uh, I mean, if you're if you're doing a project, uh, certainly if uh, you know today that performance is a critical issue in uh, your application as it is today, then this should be something that uh, you're really taking into consideration when you're um, doing the uh, uh, the transformation. So, um, there's there's different uh, points in which you would do that. Probably if there is a huge concern about this from the beginning, you probably want to do a proof of concept at the, at the beginning. I would say a proof of concept is an ideal uh, uh, a chance to test and verify non-functional attributes of your application and to see how they would be impacted if you're uh, transforming to, to, to web from another platform or just from uh, a GWT to web components. Uh, so certainly take a look at this as, as a proof of concept. Probably uh, these are things that you want to have uh, addressed before you even start uh, the, the transformation. But otherwise, you know, I, I would say that it's a best practice when you're doing uh, testing uh, in these projects uh, that you would have a specific moment in the project where you're doing performance testing. Uh, so uh, there's, there's all kinds of testing uh, that you can optionally do in these situations and, uh, you know, uh, load testing and performance testing. These are things that you can do uh, probably around the same time uh, or, or even before that you're doing the integration testing or the business end to end testing. Um, yeah, uh, certainly the, these are things that need to be taken into account and any project plan would be uh, taking performance testing in, into uh, consideration. Okay, great. Now, this last question, this might be a challenging one, but I'll throw it at you anyways. Uh, do you expect versions later than Vaadin 24 to also require modernization from Vaadin 24, or is there a commitment to support Vaadin 24 code unmodified in future versions? Um, Vaadin, well, we, we have a standard um, 
yeah, we, we have standard terms and conditions for that. So uh, I think if you go to our website, uh, vadim.com slash, is it releases? I think that's right. Yeah, so Vadim24. Uh, Vadim24, it says, if you go to vadim.com slash releases, Vadim24 is the latest stable version released under the new simplified release model. Latest version is 24.3.7, and it will be supported for free a year after the next major release, so at least until 2025. Uh, and then, yeah, Prime and Ultimate subscriptions include support until March 2028. So the, the question really is, when will Vodden 25 come out? Uh, that isn't actually uh, known yet. Uh, but at the moment that Vodden 25 comes out, then you would have uh, free support for a year for Vodden 24. And uh, if you had a subscription, then that would be an, an extra three years on top of that. All right, great. Looks like uh, that's all the questions. A lot of good questions came in. Um, thanks, Ben, for presenting today. And of course, uh, thanks everyone for joining. And we hope to see you at your at our next webinar. All right.